Good morning and a happy Sabbath to you uh, all. This is, uh, I don't know if you understand this, but um, you are actually part of our family. I know you mentioned uh, this is uh, maybe Miss Buffy or uh, Sister Buffy, but in our house it's Grandma Buffy, and we are uh, really appreciating church family, am I, am I holding you up here? Yeah, maybe you know which one they show you. The uh, PowerPoint, where it says, message seven. There it is, cool. So we have, um, we've traveled uh, 1,100 plus, whatever miles it is, uh, with at least three wheels on to, uh, um, <laughs> come and uh, spend time with our family. So I'm uh, offering a welcome this morning from the Milwaukee Central Seventh-day Adventist Church family. And uh, I know uh, Buffy's yours, and this is her church. Uh, but we're just letting you know she's not alone to you from our home. So we're uh, just really appreciating time here together uh, with you. And this morning, I have a, a message that outlines some things that we uh, touched on a little bit when we were back here in November. I don't know how many stayed for the uh, for the, the Vesper Sabbath evening, uh, but we were talking a little bit about these messages that have been given to us as an Advent people. And some may regard the, uh, the idea that uh, we're members of a church and maybe, uh, maybe even our families aren't Adventists. I know for our home, my, uh, my dad's family, uh, Raymond and Joseph, I think you guys know who he is, um, their family uh, would have been predominantly uh, either Polish or uh, Sicilian Italian Catholic. And my mom's family would have been uh, Lutheran. In Wisconsin, the all the Germans up there, a lot of Lutherans around. But, you know, one of the things that it became more evident as I got older and started to understand this faith that I grew up in. I've been raised in Adventist. Uh, Rose and I met in our church there in Milwaukee. Uh, we got married there. Uh, 30 years ago, as a matter of fact, last year. And uh, we've raised our six children there. And there is uh, a slide here. I guess I can play with this a little bit, see what happens. Uh, the message, by the way, we can't pick on Pastor Ricky. I think he's spinning every plate he possibly can. Um, and I honestly like the uh, title that he gave the message better than the one I had. So it was... Uh, the, the, the face of Jesus is uh, his title, but we're going we're gonna to touch on that in a moment. And uh, do, definitely we're keeping him in prayer, right, as he's traveling this morning and today, uh, ministering to family. But we have been blessed as a people to be called to be a part of this movement. It's not just a church. There's things going on that we're supposed to be doing in the time we're living and how that works, uh, is it about uh, being here on Sabbath morning and worshiping the seventh day of the week? Not a bad thing, certainly. Is it about uh, eating the right food, even though Grandma Buffy made it very clear this morning? There's blessing in that. You know, we have the state of the dead. We have uh, a number of things, uh, the prophetic understanding of Revelation. All amazing things, but each have significance. And this morning we're going to peel through that. But these messages that we were given as a people were to allow us to understand and have a context for who our focus should certainly be on. And this morning, before I guess I get into those slides, I was just going to share a photograph. Let's see how this works here. Here's a little bit of a picture of, uh, of our family. I'm not sure what I'm pressing here. There we go some stuff. So, um, there's, our, there's our six children, uh, Rose and I, 
Here's Grandma Buffy when we were here back in uh, November. She likes to show us around a little bit in Florida. And we were having some fun at a lighthouse, I believe, and uh, enjoyed that. And then uh, Rose, uh, if I'm really good, uh, she'll make me chocolate chip cookies. And uh, so that was my, uh, my Valentine's Day present there. But this is our family, and we consider this church uh, part of our family as well. And we just really appreciate that. So six messages, six powerful messages. Those are the things that we were touching on at that Vesper uh, back in November. But uniquely, these messages are intending to give us a focus on who Jesus is. We can have all these amazing truths, but if we miss out on Jesus, huh, what good is all that stuff, right? So we need to see Jesus. And so those messages, there'll be a little test here, and you guys that were at the Vespers, you can cheat. Um, there, were the, the, there were some questions that came out of that, and they, I see the projector turned off in the back here. I don't know if that took a nap, but I'll, uh, I'll turn here and try to watch what's going on. The, the first of these six messages, and by the way, this, this is a, just a warm-up. I'm going to go very high level with what these messages are, and we will take and hopefully know something about them because we're, we're uh, professing to be Adventist Christians. So the first of that, uh, those six messages, I think you've heard of this one. Am I hearing some amens this morning? Okay, yeah. very good. Okay, first angel's message. So then, uh, the first angel's message, it speaks of Jesus. We'll get into that in a little more detail later. Worshiping the Creator, certainly, right? So the next message, what would it be? All right, this, I'm in the right place here this morning. The second angel's message, here it is, Revelation 14.8. And uh, this then speaks of being called out of Babylon. Um, there are, there's confusion. There are things that, uh, as I mentioned before, uh, my, my family has uh, other denominations, certainly Christians, and they're uh, blessed. Uh, but we were called out of those other places. So that's the second angel's message. Next message. Well, who was at that devotional? Somebody. You can cheat. Is it? Is it the third? No, you said something else. So it was the. We're getting there. I'm hearing it. All right. It's not the third angel's message. So very good. Let's let's. Midnight. The midnight cry. Now, there's a reason that I'm I'm sharing these this morning in this order. We'll get into that in the next slide after this these messages. But that's the third message that came to this Advent movement during that period between uh, when William Miller discovered something in Daniel chapter eight and verses thirteen and fourteen. But these messages came to this movement in this order and with this emphasis. And the midnight cry came after the second angel's message. So when the Advent believers, the Millerites, were called out of their, their communities of faith, this next message was being shared. So I'm going to zip through these kind of quick because there's something important that we need to, uh, we need to dig into. So now it's the third angel's message, okay? We didn't miss one. It's really there, the third angel. And it continues, of course, in Revelation 14. So now that we've burned up the angels, any idea what's uh, after this one? Well, you just got to ask, okay? Let's, let's check it out. The, the fifth message. Ever hear that one? So that's interesting because when James White uh, was studying the Laodicean message in Revelation chapter 3, uh, the unique thing that came out of his uh, dwelling and, and reflecting and digging into it is that at that point in time, they were looking at other churches and going, wow, it must be those other people that are naked, blind, needing gold, tried in fire. Well, James 
came to that conclusion that it wasn't that, in fact, those other people. Those other people maybe have attributes that are included in it, but it turns out it, it was us, Amen. our circle of faith that's naked and blind and needing, needing that gold, needing that robe, those things. So that Laodicean message is the fifth message, comes in this order, and I'll show you a slide in a little bit, but here's the next message. The loud cry. That is the sixth message. And what we kind of concluded at the uh, at the last uh, Vespers, you know, for a bunch of people that are named Seventh-day Adventists, a little odd that there's only six messages. I don't know what, why that would be. Six? Six messages? There should be there should be at least one more, you think, right? And so I don't know if this got me up here this morning. I said I'd be willing to share with you what that might be, the seventh message, but uh, you, can't, you can't have it in November, maybe some other time. So I guess here we are this morning. Um, there is a seventh message, believe it or not. And that seventh message, a little, little cryptic here, if you can read those initials, but it's T-F-O-J. And then a question, and then you see... The text that we have here in chapter 12 of Hebrews, we've been plowing through that this quarter in our, our Sabbath school lesson, but Hebrews chapter 12 gives us an answer to what this message is. And then here's just a timeline. I'm not going to go through all of that because I really want to get to the idea that that seventh message has significance to us as a people. But if you get the idea here, there is an order. You can see. Um, you can see the uh, when the first angel's message came in 1830, the second angel's message during the Great Disappointment, the Midnight Cry, the third angel, the Laodicean message in the 1850s, and way down here on the bottom during the 1888 era, where we are then understanding who Jesus is in each of these messages. This, this sixth message continues the, the idea of who Jesus is. And then I have a little note on the bottom here. I'll explain a little bit later. But you know, the TFOJ, the seventh message, I'll explain that in a moment. But you know what? Um, I'm making a mistake here. I'm starting to say things. And this can't be me. So we need to pause for a moment, can we? And we need Holy Spirit. So let's pause, please. Gracious Father, uh, Lord, this morning as we gather, as we are here this, this beautiful Sabbath morning, Lord, we want to understand something. We need to see Jesus this morning. And so, Lord, as we reflect on the history of this movement, and the blessing that you've given. Lord, help us. Lord, let Holy Spirit speak. Lord, let me be hidden. Uh, Lord, let's hear your word. We beg, we plead. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, this timeline, these messages, the idea that we're needing to see Jesus in each of these uh, experiences, these situations that, as a movement, Adventists, Millerites, Adventists, Seventh-day Adventists, eventually, came through the significance of seeing Jesus. We really need to be able to do that in this day, in this age, in this hour we're living. In that text we had this morning, there is something I want to, and I can't, uh, I can't just pick on you, getting this right here, uh, Ray, when you're reading the text. That particular text, um, there's a word that actually doesn't belong in there. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2. When you read that, uh, when you read that in the King James, the New King James, they actually italicize one of the words in that text. And it's missing here. When it says, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. 
and then despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. What, what word is missing here? Power. Wow. You guys might have been through this before. It is the word our. That word is missing. It's not our. It's actually added. That word was added. So then Jesus be then becomes the author and finisher of his faith. His faith and honestly all. Amen. When it's when it's focused on, on the Lord. Okay? There isn't any other faith. It gets a little peculiar then when we start calling it our faith and, and we, you know, describe it in other ways. But it is Jesus says. It is his faith. So this morning, uh, you read the text correctly, but those things are, uh, and that's what we will be focusing on, is the idea of the faith of Jesus. The faith of Jesus. And that what is TFOJ, the faith of Jesus. So the purpose... The purpose of this seventh message, you can't just have six in a group like this. There really should be a, a seventh message. So this morning, it, it is important that we discover what this means. We need to understand what does it mean that Jesus finishes, perfects our faith. And if we've been in Sabbath school this quarter, we've certainly been nibbling on that, haven't we? There's been things going on in the, the study on Hebrews. But faith, the word faith, occurs just between Hebrews chapter 10, verse 22, and, and Hebrews 12, 28 times. So there must be something to this that we should be paying attention to. 28 times? Well, then verse 22 speaks of the full assurance. Verse 25, so much more as you see the day approaching. What day is that? Christ's return, the Day of Atonement, these things, you know, how many other circles of faith can you look into their archives? Can you see an emphasis on Jesus that allows us to understand uh, sanctuary words that describe Jesus? And then verse 37, it says, Yet a little while, and he who is coming will come, and he will not tear. Well, that's that's our uh, our focus this morning. He would be that idea of Jesus being the focus, the focus of our faith, the focus of the, the truth we've been given. So how important, how important is faith for those living during the Day of Atonement? Do you think uh, this was just for Jesus? You know, he's our example. He worked with the disciples, but do we need that kind of faith? Amen. I think we do. This is the time, I believe, more than ever. You know, when you look back at the scriptures and you see all the things the patriarchs, the prophets were uh, being told, being shared, what they wrote down. Interestingly enough, those things that they were given, they pointed to what's going on right here and right now, the things we're actually experiencing. The faith challenges, the faith affirmations, the blessings, those are being pointed at right here, right now, the day we're living in. So the next part of the faith of Jesus in Adventism, this is the missing seventh message, the faith of Jesus. And honestly, I believe wanted to be one of our landmarks. So the brief history, brief Advent history, an excellent way to review our history and to look through the movement is to consider these messages, certainly. But they help us to find in the Bible, as uh, we, dis we study God's Word, we find these truths. But these are intended for, these truths are meant for right here and right now. And the, the emphasis of those truths, each of those messages, gives us another way to see who Jesus is. You know, one of the things I get out of this, and uh, there's a um, there's an emphasis here on that. I'm going to explore a little bit, go through this slide, and go to the next one. We'll go to the first angel's messages, the first angel's message. But what I want to share is this idea 
that we've been given all this detail. The Bible's just filled with all this information. We're seeing world history. We're seeing Christian history. And then now we're, del we're del uh, delving into and dissecting Advent history. So that our own history. As we go through these details, it just strikes me is that we have probably less and less time to study these things out in their entirety. So when we're seeing these messages being given, where we're given the sanctuary, we're given the other uh, truths we have as a people, what I'm finding is, is that they are able to help us kind of fast forward to some specific details. I really appreciated uh, uh, Dad and uh, Buffy's uh, ministry because what they were doing was all the legwork. They're digging into our history and they're finding the details and they're sharing that. And so many of those things, uh, how many of those things could we find on our own without some help? Mm -hmm. To dig into those details and to be able to understand them. So the brief history, this first angel, we talked a little bit about the timeline a moment ago. Looks like that, that uh, projector naps on its own there. Um, but back in 1831, William Miller, he really dug into the Bible. And here's a guy who, even at one point, didn't even have a profession of faith. He, he just rejected it until he was in battle, he was in war. Some things occurred that made no sense. And then he needed to question what was it that God was doing in his life. But that first angel, that first message that came out of that experience involves understanding who God is. And boy, oh boy, do we have challenges today with who God is. We're living in a society and a culture that rejects continuously who he might be. Uh, did he, in fact, create us? All kinds of explanations, right, that are given to, uh, to take us from that. So this message, a messenger with a message to, for the world, the everlasting gospel, the good news of Jesus, comes in that who should we worship message. Now the second angel, um, again, becomes, beginning in 1844, that summer, after the churches began closing their doors, uh, there's this movie that was put together called uh, Tell the World. You ever seen that? It is a, a history on the Advent movement. There's some interesting imagery in there that shows how uh, uh, Millerites, it would be Millerites, were experiencing life, real life experiences. And these churches were not happy to be hearing this stuff all the time about Jesus coming, Jesus coming. Can't you guys talk about anything else? Well, what should we Christians be talking about? I kind of wonder. Jesus, you think, and he's coming. But during that period, uh, ideas were being floated that we no longer uh, should be talking about Jesus and then being called out, at least talking about him in, his, in the context of his soon return. So that message then... See, see what's going on. That message and the target allowed us to be able to share Jesus in a context for the end of the world. So now this next message, the second angel's message. I did the first, I'm on the second. We just kind of covered that in 1844, that summer. They, they were sharing that, then there was the seven month movement that moved it to October of 1844 and then it continues on to the third message and that wasn't the, the third angel by the way was it anyone remember what it was midnight cry. all right very good there we are. midnight cry so from matthew chapter 24 or sorry verse matthew 25 verses 1 through 13 we begin to see what's going on. Uh, Samuel Snow was pointing out um, that this date, the seven-month movement occurred. This date was uh, explaining 
Uh, based on the Jewish calendar, they sorted some things out. But what was going on here is that we were understanding, again, the idea that Jesus is in this movement. Jesus is in this message. And the, the, the parable, is the word I'm looking for, the wise and the foolish virgin, virgins, having oil, having no oil, knowing that um, I need to move ahead. Am I keeping up with my final slides here? Okay. We need to know that uh, the oil represents Holy Spirit revealing Jesus. So again, the messenger and the target. Jesus with a message, not for the world now, but for the church. Amen. Okay, for the church. And then the actual experience. I often ponder this. What was it like to really believe that Jesus was coming on a certain date? We can be critical. Certainly we could say, oh, that was crazy. Why would you even do something like that? And look at all the fallout. That's not the thing that I want to draw on. What would it be like if you really sincerely believed that there's a date that Jesus is coming on? What kinds of decisions do you make? Do you go home and get a nap in this afternoon? Do you, uh, you know, check on your 401k? Do you uh, make sure the bills are paid? I mean, what kinds of things do you go and say, nah, those things really, they're really not that important. There's something else that's important. Exactly. Nothing else would matter. Do, do my kids think like this? Do, do my parents, my neighbor, right? you know, our dog runs over in his yard, he drives him nuts, uh, you know, all of that. Am I, you know, over there apologizing? You know, I don't, I don't, uh, we don't want our dog in your yard. And by the way, really, Jesus, he's coming. He's really coming. Yeah, Tim, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, get your dog out of my yard. You know, that kind of talk. But you're wanting to think in those terms. And if we have this in our heritage, this is who we're supposed to be, do we think in those terms? Do we really think like Jesus is really coming? And that, that passing of time experience, boy, that, that movie again I was referring to, The Tell of the World, there's some just heart-wrenching uh, imagery in there that shows people that are really convicted. They're thinking in the terms of Jesus is coming and it's over. You know, the stories about the gardens that weren't tilled and they left things in the ground and, and all of that. Just unbelievable. But to think in those terms, to be able to understand Jesus' return in that, in that manner, the passing of time. Now I want to get to the third angel. This is post that period. We think the three angels' messages, which, by the way, is a neat and an appropriate abbreviation for what I'm explaining here this morning. But what we're doing is just saying, wow, so that third angel, the things that go on in that third angel's message that are honestly gut-wrenching, out of the, the three, that's probably the hardest of the messages to listen to. It sounds like there's some pretty bad things going on there in that third angel. And the key words when you're saying worshiping the beast the image, the mark, the wine, the wrath of God being poured out, um, the commandments, and then there's the, the faith of Jesus. But I ponder that particular message, that, that third angel this way. Maybe since having children, I have a little different context for how that maybe is being heard. But when we've had our kids playing outside, uh, when we lived in the city of Milwaukee and they played in the front yard, and if Caleb or, or, or Seth or Katie would go run out in the street, do you think that Rose and I just kind of stood there calmly and said, oh, Caleb, Caleb, come, come back. Katie, you know, don't, don't go over there between the car. Oh, no, we didn't, we didn't do that. We were concerned. We were anxious. We didn't want to see something bad happen to our children. So it's, Caleb! Don't! And 
then you you run after them and you try to protect them. That's the message I hear in that third angel. When you see God explaining the things that are going on and how he doesn't want to see us.